Hello, good evening, good morning, whatever time you happen to be listening to this. My name is Adam Wood, and today I'd like to talk to you about opioid prescribing and specifically some updates for the practicing physician assistant. Um, keep in mind, even if you're not a physician assistant or say a physician assistant student, this could still apply to you if you're a nurse practitioner, physician, other pharmacists, etc. Um, but this is really my target for, for this particular talk, uh, which I'll be presenting at the uh, FAPA conference in 2019. Um, just to give you a little background on myself, I am a pharmacist by trait. Um, I am also uh, a clinical toxicologist that takes calls for the Florida Poison Information Center in Jacksonville. Uh, I work clinically as a pediatric clinical pharmacist at Nemours Children's Hospital, and I'm an assistant professor at the Nova Southeastern University PA program in Orlando. And so um, I think this talk is, is really important for a number of reasons, namely that this is probably gonna affect many of you, whether you're working uh, family practice, whether you're working emergency medicine, critical care, anything like that, um, where you might run into patients, uh, either you're prescribing opioids for, or who might be on opioids themselves. And so um, I'd like to kind of walk you through some of the changes that have been happening and some of the ways we can kind of help look at some best practices uh, in order to make sure we're prescribing opioids uh, safely and effectively for our patients and, and basically how to kind of optimize treatment for those patients. The objectives I'd like to cover today is that I, I hope that by the end of the presentation, you're able to, uh, one, describe sort of the scope of the opioid epidemic in Florida. We're going to go a little bit into the history about um, different trends in opioid prescribing and specifically our state and also at a federal level see some of the changes that have been occurring over time and then i'd like you to understand some of the changes that have occurred most recently in july 2018 with florida house bill 21 and how you're going to be somewhat restricted and how you are going to be prescribing opioids for your patients Next up, we'll talk about how to locate a patient's controlled substance filling history using what we call Florida's Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, or the PDMP. Uh, this is also otherwise known as E-Force. Uh, next, we're gonna be describing some of the recommendations for safe opioid prescribing for not only for acute patients, but also for those chronic pain patients. In some ways we can help to kind of optimize therapy for them. And then try to determine which patients are gonna be good candidates for naloxone co-prescribing with opioids. And this is probably gonna be one of the, um, the newer things um, that you may consider introducing into your practice, uh, mainly because it's not something that's really been done all that frequently in the past, uh, but I think it's something that's gonna be more and more recommended as time goes on, and it's something you may wanna consider for your more at-risk patients. Just to let you know that I currently have no relevant financial disclosures to make at this time. So um, just to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page here, I want to start off with the basics, essentially. So when we refer to opioids, what specifically are we talking about? In, in broad terms, we're talking about anything that's derived from the plant, the poppy plant, the papaver somniferum, which you can see uh, located here to the right. Now, when you're talking about opioids and opiates, there's actually a bit of a distinction there. So just in case you ever, you know, this comes up at a trivia night or you'd like to wow your friends with your knowledge of, of illicit substances. Um, when we talk about opiates, natural opiates, these are typically things that are derived specifically from the poppy plant itself. This includes things like morphine, codeine, and also something that will become important later on in this talk, actually heroin. Now, since then, we've developed more semi and synthetic opioids, which share either some structure, some st structural similarities with some of those natural opiates, uh, and we have some things that actually look nothing like it chemically. So those are what we call the synthetic opioids. Uh, and so that's basically the distinction between the opiates and the opioids. Really anything semi or synthetic are called opioids. Clinically though, you're probably gonna hear us use the terms interchangeably. It really won't that make that big of a difference. But um, to give you an idea of what falls into that semi and synthetic sort of category, um, this includes things like hydrocodone, this includes your oxycodone, fentanyl, methadone, buprenorphine, really anything um, that has been derived um, from a structure that is pretty dissimilar from those natural opiates. And so how do these drugs work? I'm going to try to get down just to the, the bare bones here, uh, specifically in its actions on the mu opioid receptor. They're basically going to be working to block pain transmission by activating inhibitory neurons in the spinal cord. We also believe there's some possible sites of action in the CNS itself um, in order to dull the response and perception of pain. 
And so they're also kappa and there's delta receptors that also have some mixed actions as well, but mainly for our purposes, we're interested in the mu opioid receptors. The reason for that is because this is where we see the majority of the actions that we're really concerned about as clinicians from opioids. This includes things like the analgesia, which is typically what we're shooting for when we're prescribing opioids to patients. This includes euphoria, which can help to lead to uh, a lot of the potentially addictive sort of properties of these medications here. Also include things like the anti tussive effects. So if you ever to prescribe something like Tussie X or hydrocodone for a cough, a lot of this is related to the actual the respiratory drive uh, suppression that happens um, on the cough reflex uh, from the opioid activities. Now, the mu receptor is also responsible for the majority of the adverse effects we're also worried about as well whenever we're using opioids for our patients. This includes some of the more mundane sort of expected side effects, things like constipation. You know, just about every patient who's on chronic opioids are going to develop some degree of constipation. And then again, as I mentioned, more specifically, the things we're concerned about are going to be both the physical dependence and the addiction. Keep in mind, these are two distinctly different things between physical dependence and addiction, which we'll kind of delineate a little further on down in the lecture. And then also the respiratory and CNS depression. Obviously, we care about this because if someone's going to die from an opioid overdose, this is what it's going to be from. Basically, the respiratory drive will be suppressed to the point where they are not responding to elevated levels of CO2 in the blood, and they will stop breathing, and they will die from hypoxia and eventual CNS um, ischemia. Now, let's look at the trends in opioid prescribing through time. And you'll see here that this is going to end in, in 2013. So, um, Still fairly recent data here, but I think the trends is really what we're shooting for and looking at. And you can see on this figure, this is opioid prescriptions dispensed by U.S. retail pharmacies. And it goes all the way from 1991 on the left over to 2013 on the right here. And basically, this is the number of prescriptions. And notice here in the brackets, this is in millions, right? So millions of prescriptions going out for this stuff every year. And what you'll notice is, is that from for basically since 1996, you've been seeing a pretty drastic increase in the number of opioid prescriptions that were going out since we had things like the introduction of Oxycontin. Now, for those of you that know Oxycontin, this is the extended release form of Oxycodone. There's a large marketing push coming from the manufacturers of Oxycontin that they were saying that, hey, you know, this is an extended release sort of drug here. It has a nice, you know, long duration of action. It's going to be really good for chronic pain. And, hey, because you don't really get those big peak effects like you see with an immediate release form of the drug, there's really not a whole lot of addiction seen with this. So they really tried to downplay the idea that you can prescribe these pretty much with little to no fear of patients becoming addicted to these medications. So, you know, there's a lot of marketing push for it. Physicians felt comfortable prescribing these uh, medications, especially for more chronic sort of types of pain. And so we started to see the prescription numbers starting to go up. Not only that, but in 2001, this is where the Joint Commission actually introduced some of the new pain management standards. And of course, if you know work in the hospital, you're very familiar with the Joint Commission uh, and some of the things that, you know, a lot of your practice gets dictated based off a lot of the standards the Joint Commission puts out there. And so they started to push this idea of pain as being a fifth sort of vital sign, saying that you really need to assess pain in all these patients. And if they have pain, it needs to be managed, whether that's what they're presenting with or not. The reason why you're initially seeing that patient, you need to do something about it. And so because of that, more and more people are being prescribed as opioids. And we started to see huge numbers of prescriptions going out, increasing every single year up until the around year 2011, 2012. You start to see a little bit of a plateau and now it's starting to dip down a little bit. Now, it may sound like it's a promising thing to start to see those numbers dip down, but we're going to look to see that that actually may not be the full issue being resolved there. And look at some of the reasons why that dip down is probably occurring. So looking at the other scope of the problem, not just the number of prescriptions we actually have going out, but let's look at the actual negative outcomes occurring here because of these opioid prescriptions being filled here. And so from 1999 to 2017, roughly 700,000 people died just from drug overdoses in general. And just in 2017, just to give you an idea of what number of those include opioids, about 68% of them. So over two thirds of the drug overdoses we were finding they're related to these deaths, um, happen to be associated with opioids because they're so commonly prescribed. And for many, many years, if you look at the top 200 drug list, top 200 drugs that are being prescribed, hydrocodone, oxycodone, they're very either at the top of the list or very close to the top. And so what we find is that this number of deaths were going up pretty drastically here. And looking at that, the rates of deaths occurring with opioids, six times higher 
2017 than it was in 1999. And they estimate roughly, and this is from the CDC, that 130 people are dying every single day from an opioid overdose. Now, know here as well, this includes not only prescription opioids, but also illicit opioids. That means things like you're buying off the street, including your heroin and some of these other opioid congeners, things like fentanyl that are starting to get laced into the heroin, which we're going to discuss here in just a few minutes. So let's look a little bit more specific to this conference. And we see that looking at this graph, we're starting off in 1999 on the left here, all the way up through 2016. We're looking at the rate of opioid related overdose deaths in Florida with the red line being Florida and the gray line here being the US numbers. And so basically what we're looking at is the number of deaths. These are age adjusted. So again, they're taking out the fact whether older or younger patients were receiving these and they died related to that. Uh, and this is the rate per 100,000 people here, right? So you can see that for the most part, Again, a lot of people like to be a, above the curve. This is actually one of those cases where we don't want to be that. Uh, you see we're actually well above these national averages throughout the year. However, there's an interesting little bit of a dip here that happened in 2011. You start to see that we actually dip below the national levels, and then now we're starting to go back up. And what's interesting here in 2011, we were going to see that there was a number of new policies and legislation that was introduced here that made pretty big changes in how we were one um, – monitoring opioid prescriptions and what patients were receiving. And also um, there's a lot of crackdowns that we're going to see on what we call these pill mills or these uh, places where they're filling um, illegitimate prescriptions uh, in very, very large amounts here. So we saw that there was a pretty significant drop in deaths that occurred here. However, you're starting to see it starting to climb back up. And so we're going to see why that is in just a few minutes. And I'll tell you that it's not necessarily due to prescription opioids. It's going to be due to some of the illicit substances they're getting off the streets. So what were some of the changes that occurred here? So the first thing we have, and this was started back in, in September of 2011, was the implementation of eForce. Now, this is not a new sort of program, and it wasn't at the time either. In 2011, several states have been doing prescription drug monitoring programs for many years before us. Uh, and Florida tends to be a little bit behind the times for, for programs like this. And actually, before this was federally or state mandated, um, this is something that was actually being uh, paid for privately. Private individuals were, were making donations to, to make this program run, essentially. And so uh, this is the Electronic Florida Online Reporting of Controlled Substance Evaluation Program. Again, not a super catchy name, but the acronym is what really sells it, E-Force. Sounds like a really powerful name, right? And so basically, this is a system that you could log on online. And if you were a either a prescriber or a dispenser, so you could be a PA, nurse practitioner, pharmacist, doctor, anyone mm -hmm. could log in. And they could go ahead and see basically the controlled substance filling history for your patients. Now, there's originally some caveats here, and what you found was there's some initially some limitations that have since been somewhat fixed a little bit due to some of the new legislations. But initially, they were looking at Schedule Two, II, Three, and Four medications, which we know those are most likely to have um, higher abuse potential, uh, more so than their C5 medications. Um, and again, what it was looking at was it not necessarily every administration of an opioid. So, for instance, if you got uh, if you went to the ER uh, for abdominal pain and they gave you a dose of morphine, that that wasn't really captured. But if you wrote them a prescription for hydrocodone and acetaminophen and they went and filled that at a pharmacy, that pharmacy then had to report that out. They actually had seven days to report. So if you had someone who's kind of doctor shopping and going from office to office within a week period, you wouldn't find a lot of that information. Um, so there were some limitations there initially, but um, again, it's good to at least see we are starting this process of being able to look into and seeing what patients were even picking up because before we either had to go off of what they were telling us or kind of look around and call the different pharmacies and just hope we were going to find something essentially. Um, also note that it didn't apply to anyone under the age of 16 at the time. Um, so again, more kind of geared towards our more adult sort of age patients. And it only had information for the last four years. Afterwards, they would purge all that data. So um, the other big caveat here that I'll notice, and I, I kind of underlined and bolded this because of the fact that um, initially review by practitioners was not mandatory. And in fact, I remember when this originally came out, I was actually in my fellowship I was actually, um, you know, working in ICUs and, and ERs and things like that. And I'd be like, hey, did you happen to look up that patient's E-Force to see, you know, are they legitimate? Do, they, do you think they have legitimate pain issues? Let's see where they were filling at. And a lot of providers had no idea what the heck I was even talking about. So I got them all logged on and got them registered and everything. And they, you know, actually found some really interesting information, either people that they thought were perhaps having uh, illegitimate pain concerns. And they thought that they were just looking to 
you know, get some pain meds, found that they really hadn't been feeling very much. And so it seemed like they had a more legitimate case for them or people who they thought maybe it did have legitimate pain had actually been filling prescriptions all over the place and actually seemed to be more like I have a red flag. And you could print that out, take it to the patient, be like, hey, look at this, try to explain this. And, and it would be able to give you a little bit more credence when um, kind of faced with that sort of objective information. Anyway, here's a link here. You can look this up and honestly, you know, you can just Google it, right? So you can Google eForce or Florida PDMP or anything like that. And you're going to be able to find this information very quickly. I urge all of you, if you have not already, which I imagine most of you have, to uh, log on to this, get registered. So that way you can start to look up your patients if you have legitimate concerns about what they've been filling uh, at pharmacies. So again, we, we mentioned that prescription opioid deaths really were starting to diminish after the year 2011. So of course it was due to things like the mandatory reporting of controlled substance prescriptions through e-force, like I mentioned in the last slide. But also we started to see that law enforcement was really starting to crack down on these pill mills, right? Places where prescribers and pharmacists were writing and dispensing for prescriptions of hundreds of tablets of oxycodone and hydrocodone. And in fact, we talk about the Oxycontin Express, where basically Florida was the the origin of a lot of these medications. You can have people coming from states like West Virginia and Kentucky. They're being brought down by the busload to go to these pill mills to fill up on all these prescription opioids and then take them back to their states of origin and dispense them out and sell them. And so we really started to crack down on those. A lot of people went to jail for this. A lot of pain management clinics got closed down, et cetera. And what we saw was is that while the prescription opioid deaths were going down, mainly due to the fact that prescription opioids were more expensive now, so say, for instance, you used to be able to buy an Oxycontin for, say, $8 a pill. Now it's on $15 a pill. And so because of that, these people are still physically dependent on these opioids and are addicted to these opioids. They need something else. And so what you found was a reciprocal rise in the number of heroin-related deaths. They're having to resort to these illicit opioids. And not only that, heroin's bad enough, but now they're starting to be cut and laced with some of these other synthetic opioids, things like tramadol, things like fentanyl and other derivatives of fentanyl, like carfentanil, things that are hundreds of times more potent than heroin. And so I don't know about you, but I don't know that I would necessarily trust someone off the street to cut my heroin with something like fentanyl. It's extremely potent. It's dosed in micrograms. And so you find that people would say, hey, I'm getting my normal dose of heroin and not realize it's being cut with something as potent as fentanyl. And all of a sudden, they got extremely respiratory and CNS depressed, and they died from that. So this is why you saw the prescription opioid deaths were going down, but heroin-related deaths were going up. And so essentially what we're seeing is this sort of three waves of opioid overdose deaths where we can see that initially we had this uh, per going to be our normal, commonly prescribed, natural, semi-synthetic opioids, methadone, hydrocodone, et cetera, right? You can see here they're going up and they kind of trailed off around 2011. Starting to pick back up again a little bit, but they definitely uh, plateaued out, if anything, right? Next, you saw that secondary wave, that rise in heroin overdose deaths. And again, it started around 2010, 2011. You start to see that go up pretty significantly here. And now it's starting to plateau off a little bit because of the third wave. This is where we're finding that we're having more and more of these synthetic opioids like tramadol, like fentanyl, like carfentanil, starting to be laced into these substances here. And we're starting to see these are now starting to skyrocket, right? Now, again, this isn't just illicitly manufactured fentanyl, but this is also maybe pills have been prescribed or things like, you know, fentanyl patches, um, tramadol, et cetera. Okay. So that's kind of the trends that we're seeing here is that more and more people are resorting to these synthetic opioids. Again, sometimes they don't even know that they're getting them, especially when they're laced in heroin and whatnot. But because we made it harder to get those prescription opioids, these people are going to do something to get their fix. And so they're turning to other alternatives. Now, again, to look at this specifically in Florida, we are looking at the number of opioid related overdose deaths in Florida. We can see the total here in the yellow bar. We see heroin in the red line. We see synthetic opioids in the purple line. And this green line is gonna be the prescription opioids. And again, we see the same sort of three waves occur here. We're finding that, okay, we see our prescription opioids going up, 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 up. 2011, they start to go back down. Because of the second wave, we're starting to see heroin starting to peak back up. And then now we're starting to see the synthetic opioids really starting to take off. So again, we cracked down all these pill mills. We made it more difficult to get a hold of these prescription opioids, but look at what we're seeing. The numbers are higher than they ever were. So do we really do a whole lot of good? Who's to say, right? It could be debatable. But let's look at some of the other changes. Look at, look at the actual laws that go into prescribing these opioids for, for our patients. And so 
like I mentioned, Florida's kind of behind the times on, on several things. And so one of those was actually getting the ability to prescribe controlled substances for um, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. Okay, so again, as early as January 1 of 2017, PAs in the state of Florida were able to prescribe for controlled substances. And so basically there were several different uh, restrictions placed on them. And again, I only mentioned this for the historical context. You can see where we are, where we've been, and now you can see kind of where we're going. But basically, um, first thing was they had to have a minimum number of continuing education credit hours on state focal prescribing. And again, this goes for each renewal. So they had a minimum of three hours. Um, they also could not be prescribing in a registered pain management clinic. So again, if you worked in a pain management clinic, you'd actually have the physician who is on duty there, the one responsible, actually be the one who's making all the prescriptions there. Okay, that was part of the, the original restrictions. And then also, and you're going to interestingly see that this is something that got mimicked with some of the newer laws that came out a year later, but basically for C2 prescriptions, and again, when you think about C2s, this is your oxycodone, this is your hydrocodone, this is your methadone, all of your pretty heavy duty sort of opioid analgesics got limited to a seven day supply. They had no specific restrictions on C3s through fives. So again, things like pregabalin or Lyrica, things like tramadol, um, you know, could be prescribed with no uh, restrictions other than what federally was stated. You know, you had the six month limit, et cetera. Um, and again, part of that law was that you're not just gonna write for sequential seven day supply. So I can't just write for four seven day supply prescriptions for a C2. It didn't really fit in with the letter of the law, okay? Other restrictions meant that you couldn't do any kind of um, prescribing of controlled substances for psychiatric mental health issues to children under 18 years of age. And then it also did not apply to medical marijuana at the time, okay? which again, we know medical marijuana is a relatively new thing for Florida as well. So the most recent thing we've been living with now is House Bill 21. This actually went into effect July 1, 2018. And again, it was seeking to expand on some of the previous laws that were trying to curtail that prescription opioid abuse. And so one, it placed a much bigger emphasis on checking that PDMP, because remember we said before it wasn't mandatory for providers to check it. And again, I had, I had a lot of providers that just didn't even know about it to begin with. Uh, and then also it made big restrictions on the amount of opioids that could be prescribed. And this was specifically um, on the day supplied, not necessarily the dose you could administer, okay? Or dose you could be prescribing there. And so again, this take control controlled substances. That's kind of like the big marketing push that the um, Florida Department of Health has been putting behind um, educating and, and letting people know about these new changes. So specifically, what did the PDMP actually do here? And so one, it made it mandatory uh, for the PDMP or E-Force to report on all C2 through 5. Um, again, it was before just 2 through 4. Now it includes C5 prescriptions. Again, not a whole lot of those, but still it's important. Um, again, they actually said that instead of having to wait a whole week to report on this stuff, and now it has to be in there no later than the close of business. So presumably, if you were seeing a patient on Wednesday, or an acute pain issue, you could check E-Force and figure out if they filled anything on Tuesday, okay? Um, additionally, we also included more information about what was um, actually recorded when they are filling these controlled substances, things like the patient telephone number, uh, the name of the individual, and the type of identification that was actually presented. So was it an ID, was it a driver's license, what, you know, what it, was it even? Um, again, more information you have, the better off you can uh, make informed decisions. Um, so for instance, I had uh, one patient that we were checking E-Force on, on a patient in the PZR. Uh, it was an, actually an adult patient who was there and we were looking up their information and we had a hard time finding the patient. We we're just like, what the heck's going on here? We're looking up based off the, the address and off the name of the patient, the date of birth. And we we're thinking about it like, oh, let's take out the address. Let's just look up based off the name of the date of birth. And sure enough, we found this patient. And what they were doing was they're actually putting a different permutation to the same address. Um, so instead of say, you know, 242 Rosie Lane, it'd be 2422 Rosie Lane or 232 Rosie Lane. And that's one of the things they were doing to try to, I guess, keep people from uh, catching on to all the opioids that they were picking up all across the state, essentially. Um, but again, more information typically gives us a better idea of, of hopefully gives us a better idea of what's going on. Other changes uh, we were finding with the PDMP was that we were now having to mandate that each prescriber or their designee had to review the PDMP each time a controlled substance was prescribed. And say each time a controlled substance is prescribed. Depending on your practice, you might be doing a heck of a lot of controlled substance prescriptions. Not just analgesics, but think if you work in a neurology office, you're uh, prescribing controlled substances that happen to be antiepileptics, etc. And again, it 
did not just apply to opioids. It was really any controlled substance. It applied to anyone 16 years or older. There's a few exemptions to this. So for one, if you were writing for inpatient orders. So for instance, if you're writing for morphine for a patient in the ER or on the med surge floor, you didn't have to check on those patients, right? It was only for those outpatient prescriptions here. Other things you didn't have to check for were going to be non-opioid C5 medications. So this is an important distinction. Um, specifically, if you were, say, writing for code, or Tylenol number 3, which is codeine and acetaminophen, that's a C5 as a opioid. You would have to check on that. Non-opioid C5, though, like lacosamide, which is Vimpat, antiepileptic, or pregabalin, Lyrica, which is a C5 for, say, neuropathic pain or seizures, um, those you didn't have to check on. Again, trying to make it less, a little less onerous for those people that might be prescribing those relatively low risk sort of narcotics. Also other things to, to note as well, if the system goes down or if you can't access it due to say electrical or technological issues, you're okay. You don't have to necessarily tell your patient, hey, we can't prescribe you anything because our internet went down. You just had to document the reason for not checking there. And again, the question is, well, I have to do it every single time. What if I have a, a chronic pain patient who I've been seeing for years do I have to really check them every single time? It's not really clear in the bill. We don't really know. They left it somewhat vague um, in order to give themselves a little bit of wiggle room there. So again, we don't know the full extent of this and that it really hasn't been challenged yet. And so there could be changes to this down the road. Other things, so this is really important for you, for you as uh, prescribers is what do you need to include on those prescriptions there? So first off, you need to define a few things. So one, what is acute pain? This is basically defined as normal, predicted, physiological and time limited, notice their time limited response to an adverse chemical, thermal or mechanical stimulus associated with surgery, trauma or other acute illness, okay? So again, this is something that's gonna be relatively short in duration as far as pain goes. And so some exemptions for that include things like cancer, terminal illness, palliative care, or if you have patients with a traumatic injury score that was greater than a nine. Now again, I had to look this up. I wasn't really familiar with traumatic injury scores, which I'll show you in just a second here, but this is important that you exempt some of these people here um, because they're gonna have much more of a chronic sort of uh, pain associated with their, their diseases. And so it's important to make sure we're not trying to limit how much they can get when they have legitimate needs for it. Now, if you don't deal with trauma very often, you may not deal with this injury severity score. And as I mentioned, I had to look this up, um, but essentially what it is is a way to try to determine overall looking at the patient from several different um, factors where they're receiving these injuries that they're assigned a score essentially. And so you go through different regions of the body and you would basically assign them different scores based off of their injury severity, right? One being minor, two moderate, three serious, four severe, five critical, right? Um, and then basically you take the top three scores. So for instance, in this patient here, uh, say a car accident or something like that. And so they had a cerebral contusion, they had flail chest, so you got a three for the contusion, four for the flail chest, and a five for a uh, splenic rupture. And so basically you take the top three scores and you square those numbers. So for the cerebral contusion, it goes from a three to a nine, the four to a 16, and the five to a 25. And you add all those up and that will give you the total score there. So the slide before, the important thing to take away is that anyone with a nine or higher automatically will be exempt from that acute pain sort of definition there. So that means if you just had a cerebral contusion and had the score of three that got squared to nine, you're automatically included in that. And so that'll be an important thing to consider in just a few seconds here when we talk about more of the limitations. So for acute pain, and that follows that definition we just mentioned here, for any Schedule II opioid, that's your morphine, your hydrocodone, methadone, buprenorphine, oxycodone, any of those, they may be prescribed for a three-day supply. That's just a blanket three-day supply. Note here, you don't have to write anything on the prescription to indicate that this is for acute pain. You don't have to write anything additionally on there. You just automatically know it's going to be limited to a three-day supply. Now, does that mean you can only write for three-day supplies for your patients? No. You can go up to a maximum of a seven-day supply based on your professional judgment. However, this is where you have to write something on the script. And you have to write acute pain exemption for them to be able to fill a seven-day supply. So, for instance... I was talking with a, a, a friend who works in a retail pharmacy, and he said, oh, yeah, I get prescriptions coming from the ER all the time, so I can buy a day supply of Olivortab. So he has to call the prescriber and say, hey, can I write acute pain exemption on here? And they say, yeah, go ahead and do it. Um, so that's an important fact as well, is that the pharmacist can take down verbal changes to the prescription when it has to do with some of these limitations here, okay? Um, and it, you additionally have to just, uh, just write that justification for the um, exemption on the medical records. You have to say on there why you think they need an acute pain exemption somewhere in that medical record for it to be 
fitting in with House Bill 21. Now, there's acute pain, and now we have chronic non-malignant pain, and so this is defined as pain unrelated to cancer. So again, cancer is already exempt from this, which persists beyond that usual course of the disease, and is going to be, say, more than 90 days after a surgery. Okay, so for those prescriptions, if you're writing for someone for chronic pain issues, you need to write on that prescription non-acute pain. And again, this is only goes for those opioid C2 or Schedule 2 medications there. And that will allow you to bypass the seven-day limit. So if you want to write 14 days worth of pain medications for non-acute pain, you have to write non-acute pain on that prescription. Okay, And at that point, normal federal laws will apply to that, right? So again, usually um, you can only write for a maximum of 90 days. You can't write for any refills. You know, usually people write 30 at a time, 30 days at a time. Um, so those are the restrictions for the chronic pain patients. You have to write non-acute pain. Other restrictions in, in House Bill 21 said that for patients receiving a Schedule II controlled substance, and if they were to have one of those injury severity scores greater than nine, the prescriber must concurrently prescribe an emergency opioid antagonist. In our case, that's naloxone, right? Now, naloxone is available via different routes, and so we'll talk more about naloxone in a little bit, but this includes things like intramuscular auto-injectors. This is an FZO product you see here on the left. It's basically like a uh, EpiPen for naloxone. Uh, intranasal spray, which you can see uh, located here, or you could even prescribe the pre-filled syringe of naloxone, like you would see in a code card or something, along with an atomizer for intranasal use. Okay, so again, if they had that cerebral contusion, you got a score of three, they got squared to nine, they're automatically going to get a. You need to write a prescription for naloxone to go along with that. I notice here as well, there is no mandate that the pharmacy has to dispense naloxone along with that. The patient can just go and fill for the opioid and not get the naloxone to go with it. Could be due to costs, could be due to they just don't think they need it, could be due to several things. But I will tell you that I talked to my friend, the retail pharmacist, he's never filled a prescription for Narcan along with an opioid. He's seen them come in sometimes, never once filled it. Take that for what you will. So some frequently asked questions about this bill. Do I have to write acute pain on all of my opioid prescriptions? No, we said as long as it's not more than a three-day supply, you need zero additional verbiage on that prescription. Okay, if it's a three-day supply, no additional writing is needed on there. Are there limits to the dose or frequency for acute pain prescription? No. You could write for morphine, Q1 hour, as needed for severe pain. Now, does that mean the pharmacist isn't going to call you up and say, hey, what are you doing here? This isn't really therapeutically appropriate. No, they can still call you on that. But as far as the law goes, you can still write for that. You could write for morphine, 50 milligrams, IR, Q1 hour. Nothing's going to restrict you on that. Now, again, that's a, not a very good prescription. But uh, based on the law, there's no issue to that. As long as you're writing for a three-day supply or a seven-day supply and you write acute pain exemption on there. Okay. Now, what if I forget to write acute pain exemption or non-acute pain if I'm trying to write either for a seven-day supply or, say, a 30-day supply? Well, at that point, the pharmacist can't annotate that prescription. They can call you up and say, hey, is this what you actually meant? You say, yes, that's what I meant, and they can actually annotate that. So, again, it's not that um, if your patient ever comes back and they say, oh, the pharmacist handed this back to me, said so couldn't, they couldn't fill it. That is not true. The law actually allows for the pharmacist to annotate that on the prescription, and then you're good to go. Okay, so just again, some common problems that came up. Again, the Department of Health has been sending out emails to make sure the pharmacists know specifically how they should be handling these scripts. Now, does the justification for an acute pain exemption need to be on the prescription? No, definitely not. This only has to be in the patient's chart. As long as you write non-acute pain or um, uh, acute pain exemption on the prescription, you're good to go. What if I forget to write for naloxone for a patient with an injury severity score greater than nine? Well, the pharmacist can take a verbal, faxed order. Again, Narcan's a non-controlled substance. There's no, no restrictions on that one, so that's no problem there. And then again, our acute pain prescription is only good for three to seven days. Actually, no, the standard rules still apply for a C2, so it's kind of like, you know, if they don't want to fill it during that first week, that's no big issue. They can probably still fill it. Um, again, it might be a little bit more dependent on the pharmacist at that point. And again, one other thing you might ask yourself, well, can I just write for as much tramadol as I want? Absolutely, right? So again, this only applies to C2, Opioid medications, morphine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, tramadol is a still a C4. It used to be non-controlled, right? So there's zero restrictions on it. But now tramadol is a C4. You can only write for a maximum of the six months of that medication. Okay, so again, if you want to get around, they still give your patient with some of an opioid. That's how you could do it. So what now? So we know what the restrictions are, but what are some recommendations for safe opioid practices for our patients? So what are the resources that we have for opioid prescribing? Unfortunately, there's really not any definitive 
way to manage this, right? So if you were to look up, say, treatment for hypertension or treatment for sepsis, like there's pretty clear cut guidelines of what you should do for those patients here. But however, you're going to find that pain is it's a pretty sticky wicket. My, my wife is a pain management pharmacist and, and you know, you talk to 10 different pain management specialists and they're going to give you 10 different answers on how to manage a patient. And it's so individualized and it's very difficult to come up with a clear cut guidelines on how you should manage every single patient. However, it's not to say that no one's tried. And so in 2016, the CDC actually came out with these guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. Now, again, it says for chronic pain, you're going to see there's still some caveats that might be useful for acute pain treatment, but these were voluntary guidelines. They were just trying to come out and say, hey, here's something to try to help prescribers. Because, again, it wasn't really geared towards the pain management specialists because they were experts. They knew what they were doing. This is geared more towards the primary care people, the urgent care people, the ER people that were having to deal more with pain management than they had really ever had to do before. The problem is, though, is that it's very difficult to do randomized controlled trials and then to get an idea of, like, what is the best way to manage these patients' pain? And so most of it's based on expert opinion. And again, depending on which experts you talk to, you're going to get a lot of different answers. And so since they came out with this, and CDC is a pretty respectable organization. You hear guidelines come from the CDC, you think, oh, I better follow those, right? So the government tell me what to do. And so based off that, a lot of people started to adopt these guideline practices, and, and there were so many criticisms associated with this from the AMA, American Academy of Pain Medicine, etc. And then if you ever want to read some really, really spicy critique and some infighting amongst an organization with uh, with someone else, read some of this stuff. It is fascinating. People coming through and saying these guidelines are terrible. Here's why they're all terrible. And this is why they're going to lead to all these patients being undertreated, etc. Really, really kind of interesting. However, we said that they're not you know, they're not mandated. They're voluntary. However, the recommendations here, they're starting to affect governmental and corporate policy. We start to see that certain pharmacies are now only allowing for certain amounts of opioids to be prescribed. And a lot of it is mirroring what's in the CDC guidelines. A lot of the changes in House Bill 21, the three-day limit, seven-day limit, guess what? They closely mirror what's in the CDC guidelines. So we're starting to see that even though these are based on expert opinion, they're really changing how you're going to be prescribing for almost all of your patients because you got to follow House Bill 21. That's state law now. So this could be a whole talk in and of itself. I'm going to walk you briefly through... What are the 12 different recommendations that the CDC came up with? I find it kind of ironic. They have 12 different recommendations. You think about opioid abuse, you think about 12-step programs, but regardless, the first thing they said was non-pharmacologic and non-opioid therapy are preferred for chronic pain management. Now, again, a lot of things you're going to be seeing in this CDC recommendations are like, well, duh, but they're still making these recommendations because, again, they want to kind of be comprehensive here. So basically what they're saying is that for pain management, you need to really be multimodal. It'd be nice if you could just prescribe opioids. But we're going to see that's not going to be doing best by our patients here, right? So you need to include things like physical and occupational exercise. You need to include things like addressing concomitant mental health issues, right? Because we know if they have underlying mental health issues that are not being addressed, that can worsen their pain management, okay? They have uh, coexisting depression, anxiety, et cetera. They need to be working on exercise. They need to be looking at surgical options, et cetera. Let's see what kind of non-opioid therapy we can get into, right? Maybe an NSAID is going to be appropriate for our patients. Looking at use of intraarticular corticosteroids, local anesthetics, anti-epileptics, tricyclic antidepressants, the list goes on. The point being is there's a lot of other adjuvant medications that one can either be used instead of opioids or could be used in addition to to try to reduce the total amount of opioids these patients need to receive. So the idea is you want to go multimodal, focus on both non-farm and non-opioid therapies here to try to help out our patients. But again, this gets tough because one, a lot of insurance uh, companies are not necessarily reimbursing as well as they used to for things like physical therapy or maybe the number of visits they can get, things like that. So it's, it's a lot easier just to say, here's a prescription, here you go. But again, it may not be best by our patients. Second recommendation, you gotta have established treatment goals with your patient. As we mentioned, pain is inherently subjective. And it's interesting because, especially talking to my wife, she did her pain management residency at the VA, and it's interesting how patients can be kind of psychologically tied to their numbers, right? So you say, ask them, you know, what's your pain on a scale of 1 to 10? They say, oh, I'm a 7. A lot of pain here. I've been dealing with this for years, right? And so they go and they try to optimize all their pain medications and try to get everything fixed up. And you go into them the next day, the next week, and they say, hey, how do you feel? And they say, oh, I feel so much better. All right, what's your, what's your pain on a scale of 1 to 10? I'm a 7. They get tied to these numbers because they feel like that's part of their identity now almost. And so because of that, pain so subjective, you need to be looking towards something else. What about functional goals? What about things like, can you get up and walk around the house? Can you ambulate? Can you go back to work? Can you 
hang out with your grandkids? Can you do all these different things? By focusing on functional goals, these are more objective measures to say how well your pain management is working. Because again, when you're looking at patients who have optimal pain management, they regain function. When you look at people who are getting, say, something like addicted to opioids, they start to lose function. So this is why we're focusing not just on a number, what's your pain scale from 1 to 10, but what can you do? What can you not do anymore? What, can you, what would you like to be able to do? And using those as your goals. Clinicians should also discuss known risks and the realistic benefits of opioid therapy. So you got to talk about the common side effects, right? You have to talk about things like uh, the constipation is going to come about with this. You got to talk about the nausea, vomiting, all that kind of normal stuff. Also, what are the signs and symptoms of overdose? Again, not necessarily just educate the patient, but also the people that might be around them. That way they know what it looks like for an opioid overdose. Hey, they're not going to be able to respond to you when you call it to their name or even a painful stimuli. You know, they may be blue. They may not be breathing, things like that. So that way they can respond appropriately. This is going to be really important when we talk about co-prescription of Narcan and being able to recognize an overdose. And also talk about that evolution of pain. A lot of patients have so much stigma against opioids that they say, oh, I don't want to become addicted. I can't get addicted to that stuff. Well, not everyone's going to become addicted to that, right? You have to think about things like, okay, well, there's physical dependence. If you're on chronic opioids, almost everyone's going to get physically dependent. Your body, that's how it works. That's homeostasis, right? You get used to having opioids around, right? That's not addiction. Let's talk about tolerance. How, yeah, you may need more opioids as time goes on because you get tolerant to the analgesic effects. Just because we're upping your dose doesn't mean you're an addict. It just means that you just need more drug, right? Talking about addiction, what the signs of addiction are, right? That continued use despite harm, despite the fact that you're deciding between whether to um, buy food for your kids or get your oxys filled. Those are things you need to be uh, kind of warning. Those are signs of addiction, right? And then also what to expect with withdrawal, right? People may want to go off of this stuff cold turkey. They can't, right? It's miserable going through opioid withdrawal. And so they need to know appropriate ways to taper, appropriate therapies to taper with, buprenorphine, methadone, et cetera. Um, so again, it's good to know and educate on these evolutions of pain um, so they can be aware of it and not be so scared of these opioids because they're worried about getting addicted, right? Let them know the very small subset of patients will, especially if their pain management is adequately treated. Next up, when starting opioid therapy, start with immediate acting drugs. And again, I like to talk about pain management in terms of magic tricks. You know, you don't want to start off by sawing the assistant in half. That's a showstopper. You can't do that. All right, you want to start off with, you know, easier things. You want to start off with things like grandpa finding a quarter behind your ear. So start with immediate acting drugs and start with relatively low doses if you can. And eventually, once you kind of figure out where they're stable at with the immediate acting drugs, then you can consider switching them over to a long acting form, okay? Now, again, you have to be careful here because the caveat with this is that they can, there are concerns that delays in switching from short acting to long acting can be more difficult. And the reason why they think that is is because when you have a short acting medication, you get a very quick peak effect from that. You get that peak effect, you get that dopamine squirt, a little bit of dopamine like reward pathway gets triggered. And so when you go to a chronic long acting sort of medication, the, they don't get those same peak levels, right? It has a nice kind of plateau to it. And so because they don't get that same sort of euphoric effect from the drug, they think that's not working as well. Even though it's not really the case, it's just the kinetics of the drug are different. So again, know when to make that switch, which can be difficult. And again, I always recommend consulting with an expert if you're really not sure what you're doing there, okay? And then to go along with that, by starting off with immediate acting drugs, you want to start with the lowest effective dose. And again, this should not be, you know, uh, a surprise to anyone, but be really careful when you're, considering doses above or equal to 50 morphine milligram equivalents, or otherwise known as MME per day. And if you're not familiar with MME, that's okay. I'll get you familiar with these in just a second here, but definitely avoid doses greater than 90 morphine milligram equivalents per day. And again, you're going to find that this is tough because one, there's going to be inherent issues because we know tolerance occurs. Patients are going to get tolerant to the analgesic effects of opioids. They may need to go above this pretty frequently. And so a lot of the criticism of these guidelines are saying like, well, we have patients who have been on these drugs for years, and they may be on 100, 120, 150 morphine milligram, uh, milligram equivalents per day, and they have no problems. So again, these numbers seem somewhat arbitrary. There's no evidence to show that these numbers are hard and fast. Now, when we talk about morphine milligram equivalents, this basically is something that we can use to help us to e easily convert different opioids into a common dosage, so that way we can compare apples to apples, right? Because again, we want to know the difference between 
50 milligrams of hydrocodone versus say 25 micrograms of fentanyl we don't need to be able to have kind of a common language to compare them to so with that what, what we can do is convert it into a morphine milligram equivalent or how much oral morphine is this equivalent to and make comparisons so to give you an idea of what 50 milligrams of morphine milligrams uh, equivalents per day is because again i said try not to go above 50. that's 50 milligrams of hydrocodone a day that's only 30 milligrams of oxycodone a day is about 45. to be on a fentanyl transdermal patch 25 micrograms an hour that's equal to 60. so you already if you start with the 25 which is relatively low dose for those you're already above the 50 morphine milligram equivalent per day amount uh, 15 uh, milligrams of methadone that's above 50 as well so again do i expect you to memorize any of these numbers of course not however there's an app for that right an app for everything so if you go on to either the apple store or the google play store you can go and look up the cdc uh, drug overdose prescribing app basically and so um, again has a lot of different useful resources but one of the big ones is going to be the uh, morphine milligram equivalent calculator and so you basically can put in what your patient's receiving per day convert over to morphine milligram equivalents to get an idea of how much they're really receiving uh, other things long-term opioid use begins with acute pain so again that means we can try to shoot with shortest duration lowest dose possible and again this is where our three and seven day limits really came from they say three days or less will often be sufficient for acute pain more than seven days will rarely be needed based off of what right a lot of criticism says well you can't say that for every single patient patients are all different right they're all snowflakes essentially not, not a derogatory snowflake but they they're all going to be a little different here and so they feel that it really is oversimplifying a very complex subject matter it may lead to under treatment and again it's not based on really any rigorous scientific evidence so a lot of people are really concerned with this and again this is affecting corporate practice at the pharmacy level it's affecting the legislative practice right from the state laws that are now being passed here and again seven days might not be appropriate for all patients and so you may leave them being undertreated and patients are undertreated they're going to treat themselves and that's where you run into addiction issues in a lot of cases big concern there uh, up next evaluate patients within one to four weeks and evaluate continued therapy every three months or so the idea here is to try to taper patients with the eventual goal of not being on any opioids but again the problem is it's not going to be realistic for a lot of patients with chronic pain it's just not going to happen right and then you want to evaluate risk factors for opioid related harms that means you need to incorporate plans to mitigate that risk i mean you need to educate appropriately and you also need to consider naloxone co-prescribing for high-risk patients and so who does the cd say say is high risk well if they have a history of overdose okay that makes sense they have a substance abuse disorder okay if they're an alcoholic or maybe they are addicted to um, you know amphetamines or something okay that yeah, makes sense they could get addicted to opioids as well high opioid doses so here's here we go so greater than 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day so again you could just be on 30 milligrams of oxycodone a day which is not really that big of a dose after for a lot of patients and they're already recommending co-prescribing naloxone so again not based on scientific evidence based on expert opinion be plus or minus on that from a lot of people uh, finally concurrent benzodiazepine use and i think this is a really important one because again the opioid uh the respiratory depressant effects of opioids you know by themselves are relatively low risk when considering taking them by themselves but when you co-prescribe benzos when you co-prescribe skeletal muscle relaxants like cyclobenzaprine or metaxalone that's when you really run into big issues because they have synergy together they're going to find that by mixing all these together the re respiratory depression is going to be much more pronounced and this is where we run into a lot a lot of big problems with this so i would definitely consider narcan co-prescribing for patients who have uh, concomitant benzodiazepines or any other cns depressants uh, nine review prescription drug monitoring programs prior to and during chronic opioid therapy and again you don't really have any choice in this anymore because you have to do it based off house bill 21. Um, but again look for red flags you know do the patients even fill prescriptions they're receiving um, are they filling at more than one provider and are their previous pre uh, prescriptions consistent with the patient history right they say oh I, I don't have any chronic pain but they've been filling every month for the past six months that doesn't really make sense there okay and then as well clinicians they recommend clinicians use drug testing before and during chronic opioid therapy now again i have a lot of problems with this because i feel that um, urine drug screens are uh, inherently problematic because a lot of people don't know how to use them appropriately but i urge you to know your own urine drug screen whichever one you're using whether it be at a hospital a, a quest whatever the case may be know what's being tested for and know what's not being tested for for a long time at the hospital where i did my fellowship we had a standard sort of um you know governmental sort of screen for for urine drugs test um and what you found was is that there was an opioid screen but if you were taking oxycodone it didn't show up on there 
if you took heroin, it would show up. If you took morphine, it would show up. But the synthetic and semi-synthetic synthetic drugs just did not show up there. And the biggest drug we had our patients taking were oxycodone. So it really wasn't a very useful screen there. So you got to know your false positives and your false negatives. Okay. And make sure if you're prescribing them something that they're actually on it and showing up there because it could be diverting it. Um, and ensure that other illicit substances are not present. So cocaine, THC, et cetera. Okay. Um, and again, there's a lot of concern with this because if you start to implement routine testing, well, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? Because if they know they're going to be tested, and they're doing cocaine, well, they know, okay, well, I'm just going to abstain from cocaine for a few days and you're good to go. Um, so a lot of people feel these should be unexpected. They should be something that's going to be random for your patients. With 11, avoid concurrent use of opioids and benzos. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, this is um, kind of tough because we know that when you're mixing these together, there's going to be synergistic effects, but there's sometimes really valid need for it. If you have patients with a lot of muscle spasms, benzodiazepines and muscle relaxants are perfectly appropriate. But... Just be careful whenever you're doing this and consider that co-prescribing naloxone for those patients there, right? And then clinicians should offer treatment of buprenorphine or methadone for patients with opioid abuse disorder. Um, again, most patients can't actually do this, right? Unless you have specialized training and have a certain waiver, you can't even prescribe these for opioid uh, abuse disorders. Um, so really the big thing with that is if you're worried about them and trying to get them off of their opioids, um, refer it out, right? Talk to an addiction or pain specialist. And so um, there's resources out there, you know, if you're really concerned about patients and trying to find someone that can help you out with that, there, here's a website from SAMHSA, which is a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. They actually have buprenorphine treatment centers based on location. You just click on your state, find someone nearby, and you can refer your patient out to them. Um, so again, there are plenty of resources. You don't want to necessarily take that into your own hands because one, you may not be able to from a legal standpoint. And then two, if you're not a specialist, consult with someone who is. So I think in summary, the CDC guidelines are providing some pretty common sense guidance in some cases here, but um, I think the biggest takeaways are one, you really need to have heavy emphasis on multimodal treatment. So non-prescription, non-pharmacologic, non-opioid therapy needs to be addressed, right? And then try to treat those underlying conditions. They have behavioral health issues, get that under control. They have neuropathic pain issues, autoimmune disorders. You gotta treat those first and then worry about the pain in conjunction with that, okay? And then always consider referring out to a specialist. Again, if you don't know what you're doing, always talk to an expert, right? No point in, uh, you know, not conferring with your with your uh, experts. So the last topic I wanna to talk about here is naloxone co-prescribing. So naloxone, as many of you know, is gonna be a mu receptor antagonist and essentially reverses all effects of opioids. CNS, respiratory depression, and will reverse the GI effects and wake up the bowels pretty quickly there. If anyone's ever seen the uh, Narcan reversal and how to code brown afterwards, you know what I'm talking about. It also tends to induce withdrawal in patients who are chronically taking opioids. Okay, so you're going to see a lot of those withdrawal effects are not going to be very happy with you when they wake up. Um, but again, all of it is going to be dependent on the dose and kind of what they've been receiving. The kinetics here, and again, I don't want to bore you the kinetics, right? You guys aren't are nerdy pharmacists like me, but the things that are important to note, and this is good for education, is one, the onset. How fast is this stuff going to work? It's pretty quick, right? And if you're thinking about out-of-hospital administration, you're mainly thinking about intranasal administration, IM administration, with about two to five minutes for intramuscular administration with an auto-injector, eight to 13 minutes or so with intranasal. Again, time is tissue when you're talking about someone who's having respiratory depression due to opioids. But again, good to know the onset of action. It's a little bit slower than intranasal. You won't have that immediate sort of uh, exorcist sort of effect like you would see with an IV administration, right? And the duration, pretty short, 30 to 120 minutes. I'd probably even say a little bit shorter than that, maybe 20 to 30 minutes in a lot of cases. So what that means is, is that once it kicks in, it's not going to stick around for a long time. You need to call 911 because otherwise if the patient resedates, you don't have any other Narcan around, you're kind of in the same boat you were 20 minutes ago. And so it's very, very important from an education standpoint. Now, previously, Narcan was only available via emergency medical services or found in hospitals. But the interesting thing that's changed recently from the Florida Surgeon General is they've been trying to increase the access here. And so basically, there's a standing order for naloxone. Actually, the, my friend, this, the retail pharmacist I talked to, he had no idea about this. But basically, base, it, what it says is that pharmacists can dispense a non-patient specific standing order for known or suspected opioid overdose. That means that you, as a provider, or really anyone, who could be potentially dealing with someone who has a known or suspected opioid overdose, can go and say, I would like some naloxone, and the pharmacist can fill that. Because again, really anyone can be considered a first responder if you're the first person to show up. The nice thing here as well is that naloxone is almost devoid of all side effects, right? You can put them into withdrawal, but that's not really as big of an issue as them dying from 
CNS depression, respiratory depression. So by administering this, it falls under the Good Samaritan Act. So people can feel very comfortable giving this because there's relatively no side effects and there's no, lit you know, no legal ramifications for doing so in someone if you felt like you were acting under good pretenses, right? And so here's what the standing order includes. Uh, administration for both intranasal, the auto injector, and the, there's two intranasals here, but um, they basically are telling you the dose to administer, how to administer it, and other instructions here. Notice the big thing I, I like to point out here, call 911, right? Now this can be problematic because a lot of people who are maybe dealing with patients who are maybe uh, abusing opioids or maybe using uh, illicit substances like heroin, they may be kind of hesitant to call 911. Right, because they're worried about legal ramifications, etc. So again, that's a big barrier to people actually using this stuff. But again, it's a very important point here, which I'm going to belabor here to, to some extent. But anyway, so again, there's several different varieties. Either the intranasal form that comes as a pre-filled syringe, which you'll basically put an atomizer onto it. You have to buy the atomizer separate. There's an intranasal form that comes as a pre-filled sort of uh, form there, which I'll show you some examples of these. And then finally, the auto injector. So the auto injector is kind of nice because it takes you through a step by step. Basically, you'll pull out the safety guard and the thing starts talking to you. So it'll walk you through the entire process and essentially it's like giving an EpiPen. It'll walk you through it step by step. So even bystanders are not familiar with how to administer it. It'll, it'll tell you the whole way to do it there. Easy to administer, very rapid acting, and in some cases it may be able to be covered by insurance companies. Very, very expensive though if it's not covered. This can cost several hundred dollars. And so because of that, it's unlikely that if you were to co-prescribe the auto injector, that patients, if the insurance doesn't cover it, are going to be able to actually uh, pick that up. So again, very nice from a uh, ease of use standpoint, maybe not great from a cost standpoint. We have the intranasal spray kit, where basically you just get the normal kind of pre-filled syringe that you would see like in a code cart, along with an atomizing device. And you can see it's in the patient's fine mist into the patient's nose that will cover that nasal mucosa and get very good absorption there. Now, the thing to know with intranasal administration is that you have a, a limited volume you can actually administer. It's only one ml per nair, which means for this concentration here, it's one milligram per ml. You can only get a maximum of two milligrams per dose. It may not be enough in some cases, right? With some of these synthetic opioids, you may need a lot more than that. So that's one thing to consider as well, okay? Benefits here though, even though it's a little bit slower onset than the auto injector, oftentimes gets in uh, covered by insurances. And then finally we have the nasal spray. This one's actually more concentrated than the pre-filled syringe. This is four milligrams per spray. And so again, you get a much bigger dose all at once. Maybe more likely to see withdrawal, but more likely to be effective on the very first dose here. Again, a little bit slower onset than I am, but oftentimes gets covered by insurances. But again, I had one patient, uh, my friend told me about who had a co-prescription for the nasal spray. And I believe that even if it was covered by insurance, it's still $80. Patient said, I'm good, no thanks. And walked out with the opioid with, with no naloxone. So again, a lot of barriers to this and the law does not mandate that the pharmacist has to dispense it. So as far as naloxone education goes for your patients, first step, call 911, right? No, really, call 911. Let them know they have to call 911 because if that patient resedates, they're going to be just the same boat they were 20 minutes ago, right? And let them know those signs of opioid overdose. Don't tell the patient because if they're overdosed, they're not going to know about it. So tell people that are going to be around them potentially, their caregivers, parents, friends, neighbors. Look for slow, shallow respirations. If they don't respond to va uh, voice or painful stimuli. If they have pinpoint pupils, that's great, but that doesn't have to be present, right? Everyone thinks there's going to be pinpoint pupils. A lot of opioids don't do that, right? You can see things like methadone, things like tramadol. They're just not going to do that. But in the meantime, support the breathing. Give them the naloxone, whether it be intranasal or intramuscular, and then monitor for response. If they have more than one dose available and you don't see any response, give another dose if you need to. Okay, those are the big things to, to educate on. Make sure people know about that bef before um, they walk out with you know, some of these really big opioid doses. So another question though is like, well, who should get naloxone? And there's no good definitive answer here, right? Um, there's some guidance from the Department of Health and Human Services. They recommend that if you have a dose greater than 50 morphine milligram equivalent uh, per day, which again is not a whole lot. We looked at that, uh, some previous conversions before. Maybe patients with respiratory conditions such as COPD or sleep apnea. Maybe if they're co-prescribed benzodiazepines or if they have a non-opioid substance use disorder or they have a mental health disorder. Again, it's pretty vague. There's really no clear cut definitions on who has to. And, and if you look back at House Bill 21, the only time it has, you have to give a co-prescription of naloxone is if they had an injury severity score greater than nine. No one else really has to. So again, um, it may be really tough to decide who really should get this and who shouldn't uh, based off of this. Other recommendations from HHS include um, use of illicit substances, 
Now, again, even if it's not uh, opioids that they're taking, like heroin, you can find even cocaine. Amphetamines might be related to opioids. So they may be still someone who, even though they may not, may not be prescribing opioids to them, if you feel like they're a high risk for abusing illicit substances, maybe give them a prescription for it. Again, how often do you think they're going to fill it? Who knows? They're receiving treatment for opioid use disorder, so they're on buprenorphine or methadone. Certainly consider that. And if they have any history of opioid misuse, and they've recently been released from a controlled setting. That means that they've been incarcerated, they've been in a rehab center. The big problem here is that they don't realize that their tolerance is lost, right? So if they go a few weeks or months or years without taking any opioids and they go back to their original dose, it's going to be way too much for them, and they're going to get very, very respiratory depressed and die from that. So again, that's why they are really at high risk for, uh, for overdose, and we recommend co-prescribing for them as well. So with uh, prescribing naloxone, some of the data that we have shows that it's been shown to reduce opioid-related emergency department visits. It's also very useful in case of accidental exposure. So imagine if a toddler got into grandma's fentanyl or methadone or something like that. And the other big thing is it's very, very safe. There's really no risk to providers to administering it um, from either a litigation standpoint. There's no risk to the patient from receiving it other than they may go into withdrawal, which again is not fatal in the case of opioids. And the nice thing here is it also helps to provide an opportunity to discuss safe opioid use. What is responsible uh, opioid use and, and what to do in the, these cases here? Again, an overdose isn't because someone was abusing it. It could just be due to an accident, right? And it could be because they had uh, benzodiazepines that would co-prescribe and they didn't realize they were going to interact that way, right? The idea here is to shift it from necessary thinking about prescribing naloxone to risky patients, but prescribing for these risky drugs. You wouldn't give a patient insulin without giving them glucagon. It's not because I'm worried about this patient abusing insulin. It's because insulin causes hypoglycemia. It's a known risk. So I want to give them something to treat that. Opioids cause respiratory depression. We know that. So let's give them something to help treat that if, in case it does occur. And just to show you some of the other pushes here, uh, in January 2019, the FDA is actually pushing for naloxone to become over the counter. And so they're starting to really push for that, and we'll see where that goes. Who knows, maybe next year, this will be something that you can just go and pick up from the CVS without even talking to the pharmacist. So in conclusion, we know the opioid epidemic, it's an ever evolving issue. Um, it changes every day, every month. Um, and so you need to be aware of the current trends because again, it's not just people overdosing on oxycodone, it's heroin now in Florida. It's synthetic opioids like fentanyl being laced into things like heroin. And so um, you need to be aware of monitoring these patients with legitimate pain issues and look for those patients who may be at risk for overdose. And again, if you're not sure, consult local experts, either pain management, addiction specialist, your local pharmacist, whoever you might work with, and then call the poison centers if you need help. Of course, I always like to give a shameless plug for the poison centers. If you're ever not sure, the number is extremely easy to remember. I encourage you to put it in your phone right now. It's 1-800-222-1222. Here are some of my references. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks so much.